Good evening. Welcome to tonight's shear. Tonight is a Thursday of Parshas Shalach. Tonight's shear is sponsored by Reb Pinchas Rabin and family, in the honor of the chasna of his fourth of his uh, the forthcoming chasna of his son, Morche Shol, with Etty Halperin, which is next week, uh, Tuesday in Monsi, and. I uh, understand that Mr. Rabin is always here on online, but he's not here online today because he's actually in flight on the way to the United States. So we wish them Mazel Tov and lots of Nachas. And I want to also say a Yasha Koyach to Pinchas for his uh, unstinting support for this shear. And uh, much appreciated. Before we go into the actual shear, um, the shear used to be put online by Mr. Yaakov, eh, who is on Shlichas in Wyoming, uh, a way of his being able to support his presence there. He also does rendering. For those who are not familiar what rendering is, it's when you have a property, a plan to build something. You have an architect who does the plan, but then you have an idea, someone who takes the plan and makes it into a, a virtual reality picture or video. So that's what uh, Yaakov does for Panasa. And so if you know someone who is into maybe a building project who may want, but a fundraising or for personal reasons, wants to get a renderer. So that's HTTPS colon double slash Vimeo.com slash 963-655-6. Uh, and um, so that's I'm saying it audio because some people are listening just by a recording. So there we go. Baruch Hashem, the fund raising for the Siddur is well underway, reached more than halfway our target. Uh, anyone again, you could do just say the website for, for uh, contributing. So that's https colon double slash www.kahot. Sorry, www.cohot.org slash dedicate slash products slash HP hyphen SRH. So I'm going to share with you something which is discussed in the SIDA, and that is about eating before on the morning before a fast. Now, in Tanya, there is a Lashon in Tanya, which is in Gerasat Shuva, Peri Gimel, which says that it's talking about people fasting as an atonement for various uh, sins which they have in their past. So it says, Gam ma'at. Could also eat a little bit. Some three hours before sunrise. Even if you had your early breakfast three hours before sunrise, if you had anticipated. So uh, people who want to eat before a fast, in the early morning, before daybreak, so one would have to kind of stipulate before going to sleep that you want to still have a snack or something in the middle of the night. Uh, otherwise, when you go to sleep, it's as if, as if you're being a Kabul So but here there's something about three hours before a, before sunrise. Now, this is not the same as dawn. Dawn, on average, is well, in Etisro would be about 72 minutes before sunrise, even if you stretch it. But it, it's not, even in Russia, it's not three hours before sunrise. So, where does the cheshbon of three hours before sunrise come from? So, in that article, which on the previous slide, so uh, there's the letter, there's the reference to letters of the Rebbe, who discusses this, comes up with some really novel uh, ways of explaining this. At any rate, this is a humra extra. You're fasting because of a ch for tshuva. All right, so you have a margin of three hours before. In the Sefer Haminhogim, there is it quotes this piece from Tanya. And then the compiler, otherwise known as Rebbe Lebrana, says that Tzorich Iyun in Bechol Tan is Dinoike. 
Um, Madonna, it, it, it's where you know, it's questionable whether this idea of three hours before the fast applies to other fasts or only a personal fast but sugar. Now, if that's what's written, Rebbe Leib Groner was, was, had said, was quoted as saying, that there were on occasion that Rebbe had asked him what time is dawn. It was a far, a human, like a fast day, whether it was Shasarabha uh, Tevis, whatever it may be. And Rebbe Leib asked the Rebbe in response, but isn't there a business of three hours? And the Rebbe dismissed it. Like that's got to do with a personal fast but not a public fast. Now, this raises a very interesting question. Why should a personal fast be stricter than a communal fast? That's, that's the question which I'm going to deal with. Is there a logic in a personal fast being more strict than a communal fast, which is obligatory for every? Before going to respond to that question, I just want to point out that this discussion is not relevant for Shiva Osaba Tammuz, at least in my part of the world. And this is where the Alter Rebbe in the Siddur, and that's how it comes into the Siddur, the Alter Rebbe in the Siddur by Sfira Soime. Now he's, the Alter Rebbe is, is, is translating the margin of dawn before sunrise that it shouldn't be a flat rate of 72 minutes or whatever. It's not a flat rate, but rather it is to be measured in degrees. How many degrees beneath the horizon is the sun in Eretz Yisrael, 72 minutes before sunrise in your main Nisnabat history at the times of the uh, equinox? And that is understood to be 16 degrees beneath the horizon. So wherever you are in the world, whatever time of the year, your dawn is going to be when the sun, the sun is 16 de degrees beneath the horizon. The issue is that the further north you go in the height of summer, there's not going to be the sun never goes so low beneath the horizon. As we know, there are places where you've got the white nights, uh, where there's no, no, no dark at all, or it just becomes just like, like a twilight etc. So the Alter Rebbe here in the Siddur is saying that which is dawn in his country in is actually so early that it's actually at midnight because you can't go early than midnight because that's the previous day. So dawn is at midnight. Consequently two things. Don't count Sfira after Chatzos because it's already day. Second thing it comes Shiva Osibatamus after Chatzoyis, you're not allowed to eat. Now, I believe that in New York it's a much lower uh, latitude than, than, than we are in London. London is possibly even on the same latitude as Toronto or even higher. London is qu quite high. The reason why we do have mild weather is because of the Gulf Stream. Okay, meanwhile, so what I'm saying at this moment is. This three-hour margin does not apply for us in uh, for Shiva Osibatamus because the gap between sunrise and dawn is actually more than three hours, and possibly in New York also at this time of the year. So, but uh, by other fasts, Come, but coming back to our original question, is there a logic to say that a voluntary fast should be stricter than a mandatory fast? That is my question. So we came across from learning Gemara every evening um, during the weekdays, and we came across the following. Talking about the Korbin Tomid, and it says, La keves ho echod. So what does it mean by La keves ho echod? Does it mean the morning Korbin Tomid or the afternoon one? We're Bonon, they say, my echod, meyuchod. When it says it means it has to be a very special one. It has to be the best, the best sheep in the herd has to be taken to be the korban. The best one in the herd. But Rebbe, and Rebbe says, of course you take a korban with the best in the herd, but where do you learn it from? It says a positive. It says, and then you make a vow to bring a korban. It should be the best. 
But Abono, the Rabon say, Yataka right. It says also elsewhere that you should take Mivchar, the best. But still, Chad Bechoy Bechad Bin Dover. The one Posuk is to say that when it comes to a Chiyuf, a Korban Tomit, that should be the best one. And the other one, the Dorech, is a personal vow. Utsriche. We need to have the message from Torah, both for personal vow and for mandatory Korban, that they should be the best. Now let's now look into the Rash. Utsriche. Why do we need to have? The Torah tell us you should have the you should choose the best, both for a chiyuv and for a voluntary. Yes, tzadnoite. There is an argument to say, there is an inclination to say, the one which is voluntary that has to be the most beautiful. You're giving a gift to cre create goodwill. So you want to go, so you don't cut corners on a gift which you want to create goodwill. And therefore, I understand that if the Torah says, I understand, but who says that the one which is mandatory has to be the best? But yes, then there's a source say the other way. On the contrary, the thing which is a duty, deal with the, the duty in the, in the best way. Extras is extras. Actually, extras don't have to be so nice. So there's an argument both ways. Now, um, so coming back, We've got here a mandatory fast, like uh, like uh, Tanis Esther or or uh, Sarbatavis. Then we've got a voluntary fast. There is this, and why is he volunt fasting voluntarily? Because he has a husband of, of, of Averis, which he wants to atone for. So that's a voluntary fast. So there's an argument to say that a voluntary fast should actually be better, be, be more careful. And possibly that's the Tzorich Iyun, which is being said here in Sefer and Hogim. And Lebais says it to me to say that a because the Alter Rebbe said by the voluntary fast that you should be machbir to have a full three hours approximately before sunrise. Therefore, you should say that it should become or also this chumra should be extended to mandatory fast. Which then we can, don't forget that means it's it's a chumra which is going to be applied to everyone, not just to the machmirim who want to fast extra. So they also said that that's a tzorich. And as far as they say, no, it doesn't apply only to mandatory. Fast. Only to voluntary fast. So I want to just to take that one step further, and that is when you that, that a, a kosher mikvah has to be based with rainwater or with a spring. A mikvah for Tvilas Ezra, the man after he's had the relations to be to to to, uh, to purify himself, says in the Gemara it's enough maim shuvim can be water from the tap. Or from bucket, you fill up a mikveh with buckets and it's kosher. What about when chsidim are particular to toivel times to be toisvus tare? Whether it's an every morning, whether some people only out of Shabbos, some people are uh, only out of Yom Tov, but it's clearly it's not a chiyuv. It's it's a it's for extra tar. Does that have to be a kosher mikveh, as in rainwater, or can it be just tap water, just bucket water? So this this is the the same idea. When you're doing something as a hidur mitzvah, it shouldn't be cutting corners in the country. There's a svara to say, as Rashi says, sorech liyapoiso. You should make it as beautiful because you're doing it as a as a voluntary. You're doing it as a gift. So do it. Do, you know, do, give it with nice wrapping. Yeah, nice wrapping paper. Okay, let's move on. Now, one of our listeners asked me. Now we're going to a totally different topic but also in a Gadata realm. He's asking a story, probably he's learning Dafayomi, and it has a story of Avram of Inu, when the three Maloch and three angels come, and he serves them, he asks Sarah to make uh, cakes, Lushi Vasi Ugois, and then it came to actually serving, and he serves them butter and milk and the Ben Habokar, but he doesn't serve bread. Why didn't he serve bread? So he says because Sora developed a nido, a state of nido. And therefore, that the bread became tome. Avraham Avinu was particular to eat chulim betar, so he didn't serve bread. That's the first thing. Then the Malochim turn to Avraham and they say, "Where is your wife Sora? Are you Sora Ishtar?" And why were they asking? So there's three opinions. The third opinion is. The Shagir law, Kois Shil Bracha. 
They wanted to give a Kursha Baruch. So the understanding, the general understanding is Kursha Baruch means we've eaten, we bench, we bench with a cost of wine, a cup of wine, and so we're going to give uh, some, of, some of the wine from Kursha Baruch. So here comes the question. If they didn't eat bread, so why, then they didn't bench. So why do you need a Kursha Baruch? So I did a search on my Oita Chochma, and I saw this question seems to appear in about 200 Sforim or something. I didn't browse through all of them, but I did go through quite a few. And so that perhaps the, the Malochim had sandwiches with them. Perhaps Avram had other bread, which was from before, but it wasn't fresh bread. It came up with all different. Some say that you can, uh, if you're having a proper meal of other foods, it's also all, all, all interesting. And I wasn't satisfied. Um, you may not be satisfied with my answer either. But I'm suggesting it was simply he had a bris. And after a bris, we make a brocha and a cup of wine to, to celebrate. We make a bris and take a brocha. Hashakida, she did me better. Of course, Yaak Avram Avidu didn't say the brocha, Hashakida, she did me better because it hadn't happened yet. But it was a brocha. He, he had gone through a major um, milestone here. He had been waiting to be able to do the bris. He'd done the bris. And now he wants to celebrate. He has now three um, three visitors. And so they make a simcha. And they have a kosher bracha, a kosher of, of, of um, like the case of the bris. That's what my suggestion is. Now, actually, we usually do the kosher of the bris right after the bris. Yeah? I've had this question in Moshe, the when they do the bris for the adults. In Russia, for example, there's a lot of adult bris. Baruch Hashem, it's happening. And so the bris is done in a more private setting, but afterwards can be can be even in the evening. They're sometimes doing a setting of the bris in the day, and the and the meal is a few hours later. Ooh. So then comes the shaila: Can you make the brach on the cup of wine when it's so far removed from the bris? So actually, there's a rosh in, in the din of kiddushin. He says that you could do um, sheva brachas. Even it can be a few days afterwards. It doesn't have to be right away. If you're making a feast for the chasna, let's say you didn't have a minion for the chasna, and you have a, a few days later, he talks about the svara making a bracha. Sheva bracha is a few days later. So therefore, I'm not so surprised. There can be also a bracha for a bris uh, three days later. It's not, it's not such a problem. So I'm suggesting is the shagel of was that they yeah, they say the lachaim for Avram after his bris. And so the Kosher Bracha would be the cause of Birchas Hamila. So having said that, now we're going to on, on to another question. Talking about Brisson already. So I had the following question. I don't have a slide for it, but I don't have a, a source. So I got a Shliach somewhere in Eastern Europe. So this morning, as he asked me yesterday, having a bris. So the family who are making the bris, they are shemit shemit mitzvahs. Now coming to the bris is also a brother-in-law and sister-in-law, who a couple, and they don't keep taras and mishpocha. And so the question was, could the bal simcha honor them to be kvater? The kvater arrangement is because the baby is with the mother and the bris is in the men's shul. So how does the baby get from the women's area to the men's area? So you've got an arrangement called kvater, where a woman brings the baby to the door, and her husband takes it from her and brings the baby to the bris. That's the kvater and kvaterin. Very well. Now, but if she, if they're not keeping tars mishpocha, so then you it was an issue of, of causing them to pass them to one another, which is uh, all right in the spectrum. It's not the huge, it's such a huge thing, but it's, it is something. Which is an issue, yeah. So they're asking, could he is it okay to honor them to be kvata? Not, not a straightforward answer, but I said to him, you know what? Tell the mother, sorry, tell the the kvaterin, it's such a big schus to be a kvaterin, you should go to mikvah before being kvaterin. So she'll go to mikvah. Uh, I she didn't do all the preparations. I've heard from very good sources that if a woman who's far from it wants to go to mikveh, you let her go to mikveh even though she hasn't done all the preparations. We're not talking here uh, in, in a formal way. It's going to be for the bris. She goes to mikveh. The violin, she's a 
come to a state of Tahara. Right. Um, next. What's this on the screen? Oh, behemshach to our previous discussion about um, uh, the sorrow with the bread becoming tome. So someone asked me this week that they are making a and the woman made a nice cake with the cream and everything. And, and there's also Achnos is also putting on uh, writing. Some psukim are written on with icing and she's made this whole, the whole cake and then someone was made it, she found it discovered that it's that it shouldn't be done by the woman who's a needle. And so now what do we do with the cake? Do we tell her to take the whole cake and then you know discard it? So I didn't want to just dismiss this mini role of having it dafka nido and dafka isha tahira. So, you know, let them let, uh, get an, if it's possible, to arrange another cake. So, well, they have to, and the, the kids will enjoy two cakes. So, okay, I'm sure they can manage that. But meanwhile, I looked up in, as I say, for Sheba Habris from Reb Shmuel Horovitz, also I guess, and he brings this from the Machzovitri that the cake for our for Eifir Shacheder should be made by a basula, by an, a girl who has never been married. Why is that? Because by Martin Torah, there was a three-day uh, preparation that the men were not meant to have relations, so that they should not be um, in a state of dis discharge of, of uh, Sheikh Bazar. And therefore, the Minig of Machzivitri, he was a Simcha Talmud of Rashi, close to a thousand years ago. Therefore, the Minig was that a Basula, an unmarried girl, would be the one to make the uh, cake for the Rheinfeuer uh, and then he quotes from another two sforim, Orchas Chaim and Kolboy, they say that Yesh Makpidim, in the fourth sefer it says, it shouldn't be done by a nido. He doesn't mention, this is two levels, a basula is, is more, how do you say, more limited than to say a woman when they say to a tar. Then he finishes off, that the fact that these humrus are not well known by the, popularly, that's because the Tzfor, the Rekeach, the Yosef Yosef, and Kavar Yoshor, these three well, more well-known Tzfarim, don't bring these Tzfarim. And therefore, why I responded to this fellow is, listen, it's not a big issue. If, 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 if you can see that the latest Tzfarim don't bring it. If it's, if it's no big deal, if it's no big deal at all, so you get another cake. If not, you can use it. Okay, let's move on. Right, so on Monday morning, this is and this is on your sheet if you have the printout, it's on pay a number question number four. On Monday morning, I'm in a shul, and after Shmanestra, someone comes over to me and he says he forgot to say it's a say morning brachas. What should he do now? So actually what I did was uh, I arranged that he should get birchas, um, he should have an aliyah latayra, and that way he's got birchas atayra, from his Ali al But let's go through this. So he, was, uh, he knew the question that it says in Shechon Aruch that if you've said Ahavas Oilom, the Brocha before the Shema, it talks all about, a lot of it, it talks about Torah. And therefore, if you, once you've said Ahavas Oilom, you don't have to say Bechaz Torah. Now, Shechon Aruch says that's only if you learnt right afterwards. So then the Ahavas Oilom becomes a Bechaz Torah if you learnt right away. Next thing that writes the Mechaber, that's, uh, some say that even he said Shema is also counted as Birchas. Uh, uh, by having said Avastoyim, then, uh, then Shema, so it's as if you learn Torah. Uh, Shema is also part of Torah, and you heard some of that, and therefore you don't have to say Birchas Torah late. Now, here in the Altar Rebbe Shikhnor, he brings this, and he says, if you learned right after in Lomar Achar, Krishma or Tfila Miyad. Whereas the Mechaber says in Lomad Miyad, this is explained to be right after Shmonestra, because you're not allowed to learn at that point, you shouldn't be Mafsik. It means right after Shmonestra, as soon as you could, you took a safe and you learned, so you're Yoitzu with the Arabasa. Then he brings a second opinion that by saying, even reading the Shema, reciting the Shema, already counts. That's already counts as having learned Torah, and therefore your Arabasa counts as a Birchasa Torah. So what happens now? 
do you follow the second opinion or first? Now, this this is this fellow's question. So the Alter Rebbe finishes off that we have to take both opinions. And if you did say our soil, you said Shema right away, then you cannot say Birchas Torah afterwards because arguably you already had Birchas Torah by saying our soil. So according to the Alter Rebbe, there's an Ishtav Satan because the Svara Sophie Brochus and Hawkel, you already said you already said Bechas Well, that's giving him an Ali Latera, obviously, well, was, was a benefit. In the Mishnah Brura, he brings from the Vilna Goen that Krishna does not work, disagrees with the second Svar. And he quotes from other Svarim. Then he says, if if he was saying Shema after Zman Krishna, then that's for sure it's Kakaira Batayra. But if it's before, he remains in a Sophie. So the Mishnah Brura doesn't pass him clearly. That it, like the Gura, he just quotes him and he says many Paskin Paskin there. He doesn't mean he doesn't himself Paskin that way. But meanwhile, for the Alter Rebbe, it's clear that in this case, if you said Avas Oilam and you said Shema, so be the Eved, you cannot say Bechasatayra because of the Chashash Baruch of Atola. And therefore, it was because it was Monday or Thursday, uh, there was the opportunity to give him an Aliyah. That was certainly a, a bonus. Okay, now question number five. Someone asked me the following. I don't know the person and I don't know his family condition. You know, what I do know is his parents are divorced, and his mother is asking him to say Kaddish for her father who had recently passed away or your site. But there's he has a father and mother, so I don't know whether the father is a shul goer or not. He's asking. Does he can he say Kaddish for his maternal grandfather without asking his father? Is I, I, I'm suspecting that if he would ask his father, then possibly the answer would be no, because there may be some kind of you know lack of harmony between one and the other. So it, it, he's not so keen to ask his father. So I said to him, Would your father be upset if you say Kaddish? Yeah, he wouldn't care. Okay, then that's that's okay. You don't have to ask. Here's the Loshan in Kuflamid base in, in Ramor. It says Kadash Yosem, you say, now, first of all, and I, think, I don't know why it's not followed. I go to Mishnibalach sometimes, I miss Mayim and Ashul. Uh, if there's no if there's no Kadash should be said after a lady in any case. It's end of davening, and Kadash should be said. Even if there's no Yosem in the show, should be said by someone who doesn't have parents. Someone who does have parents can also say it if his parents are not makhpid. So, coming back to our point, that he doesn't have to ask his father. If, he's, if he assesses that his father wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't bother him, that he says Kaddish, so then he doesn't have to uh, ask his father permission. Explicit. We're going to the next question. Well, yeah. So, a bit of action last week. A lot of you got these uh, notices that the Hashgocha has been removed. Chuk Sam Soifer have taken off the Hashgocha from a certain wine which is imported from Spain. Cognac, champagne, uh, milk powder, butter, surimi, which is some kind of fish, which are imported from France. And they write, even if it has our uh, logo, our stamp, and you should not use them at all. Okay. This came out last week. Uh, unfortunately, a very fine Jewish woman here had just driven to, to France to buy supplies for which she then resells to. And she bought about 12 cases of this surimi. Actually, it goes a little bit further. She had already, by one of her customers, one of the shops, had already paid her for this surimi, which she has had in the back of her van. And she just bought them the day after, 24 hours later, this, this notice comes out. So here becomes, here is, here's the question. Um, does she have to refund the money to this store, which is buying from her you know, these cases of this surimi? Let's let's take the question more. Let's you know. Uh, question is, 
if you sold something, if you sold a product which is not kosher, totally, you're totally innocent. You did not, you would expect it to know about it. But the poil, it turns out it's trade. Let's say if I was a farmer and I sold you a chicken and, you sh and it looked perfectly okay, you took it to the shaykhut, then you cut it open and you see on the inside it's trafe. Does the farmer, do I, the farmer, have to reimburse you for the chicken which I sold you? And there's no way I could know that it's got a, a hole in its puppy. Okay. Um, so the halacha is that you do have to refund. That if you sell, here you have one who sold, shechted, a, and this is from Leshna Medal in the Cheshun Mishpat. You sold a cow. So you shechted a cow and you sold it. And then you discover it's trefer. So then, if people have eaten, you're going to have to reimburse them even for what they've eaten. If you sell something which is also in a Torah, you're going to have to reimburse your customers even after they've eaten. If you sell, let's see if Gimel says, if you sell something which is also in a Rabbonon, then if the food is still in, in existence, then you have to take it back and, re and, and cancel the sale. If, it's, if they've already eaten, then you don't have to reimburse. But for sure, so long as the product is, is, is in existence, then the customer has every right to give it back to the, to the supplier. I'm going to digress for a moment and tell you a story. It's a very interesting story that there was in the Rav in, I might have told the story but on this forum, but never mind. Roving Fachabad of Schneegarelli, elderly man, and there's someone who comes to his house to ask a shayla. Whilst he's there, there's another man who also is waiting. There's a woman inside with Rav Schneer, with the Rav, and eventually, after 20 minutes, he told her what he told her, and she went out. Meanwhile, the other fellow, the other man who had waited for 20 minutes, when the woman left, he also left. So the one who's telling the story says, I was intrigued. You waited 20 minutes, and then when you got a chance to go in, then you go and leave. Said, so when you met him on Shabbos in Shul, so kind of, he is, I'm just curious what, what happened then. So they the other man says, to, I'll tell you what happened. I, I'm, I learned to tell him, etc. But recently I had an Esvora to go to another place to get training, whether it's in uh, some other some tra training in, in uh, academics or something. And I wrote to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe told me to ask Rav Garelli. So I went to Rav Garelli. So I was waiting. Then, when I hear, I can hear through the door, or well, the door is open, and there's this chicken on the table, and I hear Rav Garelik speaking to the chicken. Hindala, Hindala, he says, I'm sure your balabos gave you healthy food. He gave you as much as he could. that you went to another elsewhere. And you ate something which is not good, and that's why you got a hole, you got a nail inside in, in the pupic, and that's why, unfortunately, you tray. But had you stayed by by your, had you not gone and eaten food by uh, pastured elsewhere, you you would have been okay. So the man said, "I heard what the, the rob was saying to the chicken. I already had my answer to the rebbe's, you know, my question to the rebbe, that I uh, should not be going to pasture elsewhere." Um, nice story. Um, right, someone's asking, coming back to our Shaila, what about the woman's own money? Yes. So does the fish company have to refund the money of the woman who bought the 12 cases? So in principle, they should, yes. They would have to. The uh, But not everyone follows the halacha. And I, I said to her that she's entitled to a refund, but she was a bit... Um, skeptical whether they would they would say uh who cares and whatever they're not, they're not necessarily uh mamish uh very firm people who uh, would be uh, honor this, this halach 
so but she was with all um very impressed actually she just accepted that's the locha and yeah so I, I, I uh, gave her her bracha that Hashem should reimburse her uh, her loss with with the, with with the, with interest. Hashem is allowed to give interest. Okay, let's move on. So now where are we holding question number seven, which I don't have. I don't have an answer to that. That is a woman asked me on Friday. She has been teaching in high school for decades, and so she is paid. 30 pounds an hour. Occasionally she needs to take off. And so she'll take in a substitute. She'll take in a substitute, a, a, a sem a girl who just left sem a year ago. For this girl, she can pay her 15 pounds an hour. So she's paid by the she's paid by the school 30 pounds an hour. Her substitute is getting 15 pounds an hour. So does she is she entitled to keep the difference? Or does she have to reimburse the son, the, the school? So I discussed it with her. I asked her, does she? So I couldn't find this question. Uh, but so I'm just saying, saying in smallest. First of all, there's no secret here because the directorship of the school know when a teacher takes off and puts in a substitute. So she tells the head uh, head uh, teacher that I'm bringing a substitute. There's no, it's no secret. Um, so this idea of who's paying her, etc., is not a secret. I also asked her who's taking responsibility, who's making sure what's going to be taught, who's going to be testing on the material. It's not just the uh, the hour which you stand in front of the, the class. There's also planning and there's um, etc. So she says, of course, she takes responsibility. So I felt if that's the case, she's allowed to keep the uh, she's allowed to keep the uh, the difference. But it's for her broader her overall responsibility. I don't have a source for that, so I'm just saying as well. Okay, so what's on the written on the screen? It says number seven. It's actually number eight on our list, and that is whether you're allowed to. You have, let's say, a non-Jewish decorator, and he wants to come on Shabbos to pick up his equipment. He wants to. Are you allowed to allow a goy to come to your property on Shabbos to take stuff out? Now, a variation on that, more common. Let's say if you have a guy, uh, sorry, if you bought stuff on Amazon, and so you bought stuff and, and then you want to return it. So the Amazon um, truck driver comes on Shabbos. Is he allowed to take a box out of your premises on Shabbos? So this is a variation of the same question. So someone asked me this, and at first I was saying that that's not okay. And I looked into it, and actually you can read it over here. It says that you should not give a goy, a goy comes to your house, you can give him food as much as he could eat in your house, but you shouldn't give him other stuff. This is in Shimashin Chofes, if you shouldn't give him other stuff, which is normal for him to carry it out, to carry out of your premises. It looks like you're giving him stuff to carry out. So as if it's, as if you're sending him on the delivery mission, which is not allowed on Shabbos. But then the Shulchan Aruch continues, when it is said, if it belongs to you, if it belongs to a goy, you are allowed to give them to the goy to take out of your premises, even though it looks like you're giving him to do so, it doesn't matter, because he's not carrying it for himself, rather he's doing it so you're not carrying it for you, for the Yid. It's carrying it for yourself. And important is the Chepet doesn't belong to the Yid. So a Goy is allowed to carry out. So in our first example of the decorator who wants to take out his ladder and his buckets, whatever, out of your premises on Shabbos, the answer is he is allowed to take out his stuff on your premises. That's clear. With the, with the returns to Amazon, I'm not totally convinced say it's identical uh, halacha. Who do, who do they belong to until now? When you're returning goods, is it, is it, is it, are they doing it for you? Are they doing it for the, for the provider, for the, for the uh, seller? I'm not, I'm not totally convinced one way or the other. Okay. Let's move on. So now a teacher, school teacher is asking me, that it, she's teaching kids in Shekhanaru, 
when it comes up in Simon Membes, it says, noki yofe. Afilo ein rak dova like He's talking about the uh, etiquette at the table, to eat in, a, in a, a respectable way, and the table should be clean and it should be covered nicely, even though what you're having to eat is just something very simple. Now, you look around, very few people are particular, but every time they have something to eat, they have a, say, a tablecloth. So I said to her, my response to her was that in the times when this was written, people had a rough a table was made of rough wood and it wasn't necessarily so clean. And therefore, it was a standard thing to, as respect, it was respectable to cover it with a tablecloth. Well, Hashem, nowadays we have formica or things like that, where the table can be uh, very, very clean, uh, cleaner than what they were, than what their tablecloths back, back, back then. Okay, I was still intrigued. The Kitsu Shukhanar doesn't make up this kind of stuff. If he got it, he got it from somewhere. He writes it, he got it from somewhere. So I found it in the Bayer Hative and Simon Kuf Ayan, which didn't have a proper reference where it took it from. Eventually, I have a reference to the Shalom, and with a search engine, I was able to find where it is in the Shalom. So here you have in the Shalom, in um, Shara Oasis, I believe, in Eris Kedusha, Kuf, and he says, He's borrowing the term, obviously, from um, from Hirchas Muksa. But since the ba- the shulchan is a table, is a base for Dova Shabikdusha, which is what we'll discuss in a moment. Therefore, Sorachliyus Mechusa Benikias should be covered, should be clean. And then he goes on and he says, the korban, like a korban, the, mis- the table is like a misbeah, like the korban is to serve Hashem. Um, and so the then he says in the korban itself on the mizbeach. So the main korban is ishim yichoyach. But then there's also there's the side there's the sidekicks the ivorim of pedorim. There's also the various organs which are burnt on the mizbeach. Then he says something about the column of wind. He quotes from the, I looked it up in the poetry. So yeah, the column of of smoke. Sorry, the column of smoke of the korban would sometimes veer towards the north. And that, says the Zohar, that is because of the chitzoinim, like a yenika for sitra achra. That's a tzof, and that's why sometimes the smoke would go in the direction of the north. And so he says, similarly, at the table, push away the shmutz, uh, the the chitzoya, which is a clipper. In other words, there is going to be at the table, there's going to be parts which are going to be elevated, there's going to be parts which are going to be rejected. Okay. So whilst I'm looking, so I'm browsing, I see some fascinating stuff over here. First of all, this is the piece before. He says about Eitz Ma'achol. Now the word Eitz Ma'achol is written also by not demolishing, not um, uprooting or chopping down a fruit tree. Um, but then he said, also it mentioned in um, by, uh, by the Agan Eden, yeah? Eitz Ma'achol. So he says the word machol is the same letters as ein kol. Ein kol choy. The tree which Adam Arishna is from, which also also kriso, uh, um, that wasn't that didn't work out good, yeah. But the eight machol, ein kol choy, it's a source of all all, all um, brocha. Then he says the name yud kevavke. So yud times hey and hey times yud. It's 50 and 50 is, equals 100. And then Vovke is 6 times 5 and 5 times 6. It's 30 and 30 equals 60. So 160 is a gematria of 8. So, uh, so he has here the idea of 8. is has got a, a somehow a gematria of Yudke Vovke. And then he says the word Zer Keili. Zer Keili is a Rosh Tevis for Zer HaShulchon Asher Lifnei Hashem. At the table, which is before Hashem, this, this is it's like worse service of Hashem. And then he continues, the Nochach, because we're talking about the, uh, the tree with Adam Orishan. So if the tree, if the food at the table is eaten in the wrong way, so then the word Shulchan becomes Le Nochach. That's like following the snake. But if the Shulchan is used in the right way, then it's Le which is like the Kedusha, which is carried by the Cain Godel. 
And then the shulchan, in the proper way, becomes like a, a misbeh for atonement. And then he has the famous lotion that koyanim are eating or bailim is kaprim. It says in the Gemara that the, the Akarbonus, Kovachatos, etc., Kedish Kadoshim, the Koyanim are eating the meat, and the owners are given atonement through this. So he explains this on a deeper level that this is alluding to in a Shomis, which they have a Gilgul in the food. And if you eat in the proper way, so then you are like the Koyan who's taking the food and eating it, and the Bailim. Is the food and the and the nutsutsus in the food are going to be elevated by eating those foods the shame shomai. Just before going further, my wife tells me that her zayda, her pincha sudak, um, would was wont to say when he gave when he gave some food zaymaile and then gave some food elevate this piece of food. That was his the way he spoke. He was a you know, he who learned a lot of lekutatera etc. and so. Colloquially, you know, giving some food, he gave someone some food, Zaymaila, uh, this elevate this food. Our last question for today is about having a coffee at Starbucks. Now, um, no one asked me the question, but I was learning Kitsu Shikonaruch this week. We have a weekly uh, women's cheer on Tuesday morning, and it struck me that something which I, I, I possibly had said differently in the past and I want to go through this carefully so we have we know there's Bishal Akum and Pas Akum etc there's also Sheikho Shal Akum there's Sheikho Shal Goyim and you can see here in the second paragraph on this, the first piece for the Shulchan Aruch it says that Sheikho Shal Kusim beer whether it's beer from uh, dates or, or, or Babali uh, mead one should not be drinking alcohol of going. Just a second. The issue of having alcohol of going is in the venue where it's sold. So to, for you to go into a pub and to have a glass of beer is not beseder. You bring the beer home, that's okay. The main thing is not to come start dining with the goy, etc. Even on this, if, if I remember correctly, it's not so widespread. But uh, this is what he's talking about. To have a glass of beer, of alcohol, in a venue, or in a Goyesha venue, where it's being sold. So now let's now read. Having understood that, we're going to go now and read the Kitzah Shechon Aruch. As I said, this is in Simon Lamed Ches. I didn't say. Simon Lamed Ches, if you're base. Sheikh HaShel Tvua HaShel that beer from grain or from honey, it's, it's, it's broadly, uh, people are lenient to drink it even um, even at the venue where it's sold. It's not a problem of Bishal Akum because the grain is bottled, main thing is the water. But then you have to also investigate whether the this beverage has been made with, with um, these, whatever, from wine. That's the whole whiskey um, sherry casks uh, story. Okay. But if it's a place where Eden R lacks and they have the use Goisha wine, there's a the place where they use wine. Yes, the Baal Nefesh, the Hachmir, the Atzmir, So a person should be Machmir also not to drink beer in a Goisha venue because you can see what's with the drift. People should uh, be more careful. Then he goes on. This is where, the point which I wanted to share. Having a cup of coffee, we're talking about black coffee because with water, milk is for sure also. To have a drink of coffee or tea or chocolate in a goyesha venue. A person who is more conscientious or spiritual way should keep away from this. And this is a request from Pishchet Shuva. And then he says, there are those who mati b'derech arai, if it's an ad hoc, yes, but not b'derech kvius. So there's a difference in my mind, having read this piece of Kitzvah Shekhanara, we'll discuss it soon. There's a difference if I'm on the plane. Um, I'm not b'derech kvius on the plane. Um, I haven't reached that madrega yet, yeah? So it's derech arai. So can I have a cup of coffee on the plane? The answer is yes. 
Um, people are continually asking this. They're worried that they wash up the, the kettles in in uh, with 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 tray for things. I, I highly doubt it. Yeah. So, okay. But there are kavias. But let's say I want to, I want to do a shia with someone. Let's meet at Starbucks. That is something which would be kavias. And I think that would come into what the Kitsch Shikhanaruch is saying, that Shema Yat Nafshoi should keep away because it's Der Kviyas. Now let's take a look where it's coming from. So this is again, this is Yeridea Simon Kufi Dalad. And talking about having a beverage like beer, Bemoki Mechirasoi, puts the Barhete, of the previous Barhete, the Barhete of Marit. Um, then the this there's there's a Gemara which says that a ban, uh, that a person who's a, a choshevid shouldn't have um, chamin by goyim and the prichodosh here says that the bahalocha that's okay. Then he quotes the ponemiris who disagrees with the prichodosh, and he says the heter for beer is not because of what was said that the tvua is bottled to the water. The main thing is that their beer. Wasn't a chosh of a drink, it wasn't oil shulcham alokim, or that people would not invite someone to come over for a beer. That's what the Bach says. Avul bekave, this is upon him, here's his writing. Avul bekave, but with coffee, a neinu royois, we see she oil shulcham alokim, that it is a chosh of a drink, it is used at a chosh of a do, or mazam ni alayu, and people would invite someone over for a cup of coffee. But chain royal of al nefesh. Therefore, there is reason to be machmir, not to uh, have a coffee or tea, a tea from Goyim. And the Kitzvah Shechonoruch has made this uh, distinction between Derech Aray, as I said, on the plane, or etc., uh, on the traveling, that's Derech Aray, Derech Vias, but as I say, to choose this as a venue, I'm going to go to Starbucks to have a coffee, um, not from when you're traveling. This is just, you know, uh, to chill out, as they say. So then that would be a der kviyas l'chayre and doesn't seem to be a, a, okay, at least for the shayma nafsha, yeah? I just want to finish off that someone pointed out last week we had this um, little story about a man wearing a watch on Yom Tov and it uh, has here that that on top Shinyud base, that's 1951, the Rebbe asked, what time is it? And Rav Harlik um, was nearby and took off his watch. And the Rebbe said to him, you don't know that in Lubavitch, we don't wear a watch on Shabbat, so now on should... So I was, I thought that we would refer to Mary Meir Harlik, all of a sudden. Someone pointed out to me that he was all of 16 years old at the time. I didn't know exactly his, uh, you know, his birth date. So the likelihood is that it was actually his father, Reb Mordechai Halil who was a Chosh of Arov. He lived in Crown Heights. He would come to the Rebbe's Fabrengans. So it makes much more sense. And they if refer to him as Harav Harlik, and in uh, then they, they wouldn't refer to a sixteen-year-old book as Harav. So it makes more sense that it was his father. And uh, just so thank you for uh, Shlomo Weinstein for correcting that. Um, right. And so that's what I what I have for tonight. So I'm going to wish you all. A good evening, and we should hear a good Shabbos and uh, Shabbos Mavorchim. So we should herald in a month of Bracha. And here we should hear, have Yeshua, hear Yeshua's of Yisrael, especially the Shvuim and the Ayolim, uh, to come home safely and carry out the mission of Yisrael. And we should have a Gu'ul Shlema, the Moshiach Zedkeno, the Meir Gameno Amish. Call to.